And the Talmud, it takes seven years to complete the Talmud if you learn a page a day. And in a sense, with going through that, we've had a seven year journey. And you're all very, very smart individuals. Because you're now going to be able to go home and say, you've completed the course. Because this is the, the last night. And for some of you, it's your first evening. But it's the last evening, so you can say you've completed, and it'll be absolutely true. You know, you'll have completed the course, and you'll be able to join us all for a l'chaim at the end. Which I'm going to start now, so l'chaim, 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 l'chaim. You meant to have a l'chaim at the end, and everyone's completed it. The whole of, you know, the core HOD in, in the UK have completed it. But the truth is, my friends, when we came up with this idea, people thought we were a bit bonkers. A seven-year course, like... Will the world still be standing in seven years? Who will still be alive in seven years? And, you know, for a rabbi to suggest a seven-year course and something like this, people thought we were bonkers. Like, maybe try, like, seven weeks. But we had a dream, and it just shows, my friends, if you have a dream and you believe in it, it doesn't matter what anyone says. Go for it. It's in your heart. You feel in your heart it's the right thing to do. Follow your dream. Follow your dreams, and, and me and Anton followed our dreams, and with God's help, please God, if we get through the next 35 minutes, we'll have, we'll have completed the dream. And, and then the question will be, what next? Because the thing about spirituality is we don't rest on our laurels. When you go through the seven-year cycle of learning Talmud, straight at the end of that Talmud seum, you start the next page again. And that's why we're about to have Simchat Torah, which is the completion of the whole cycle of learning the Torah, before you get to say, well done, you're saying Bereshit Baralukim. You're starting from the beginning again. That's why, by the way, we start off on the Talmud with page two. The first letter of the Bible is two, bet, because there's no beginning and end. You know, we don't do beginning and end. We don't, oh, we're done now. Let's go and chill forever. Mm -mm. What we do is, it's a circle, it's a spiral, it keeps on going. You're learning, you've developed, fantastic, now what's the next phase? So you've got to think, Anton, what's the next phase? Maybe like a 14-year course. By the way, my rabbi in Israel, true story, Raphael, he, his courses, if you think seven years is a long time, you can only get into the course if you promise and pledge to sign up for a 40-year course. Mm -hmm. I'm not even joking. He started a new cycle last year, and he did start it by saying, you know, welcome everybody. He said, I'm not quite sure I'll be here at the end of it, because he's 74. <laughs> and, and, and he wasn't, you know, taking it for granted that he'll be there at the end of it. But, um, so 70 is actually isn't as much as, you know, my, my, my rabbi's course is, but just a huge point at this point, just to say a huge thank you to Anton for arranging it, for organizing it, for dreaming about it. So, I, I'm into round of applause, so a big one. <laughs> Okay, let's begin. So, tonight's class, which is essentially mapping out Jewish history, mapping out all the levels of Kabbalah, we call it 49 Steps to David, it's about King David. Last time we spoke about Mashiach, we spoke about Mashiach, so there's only one step after Mashiach, which is the one we're going to speak about tonight, which in Hebrew is called Tchiat Hamitim. Which means, anyone, the English of Tchiat Amitim? Resurrection. 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 Any one of you seen this program on, on TV called Walking Dead? Any of you seen that? Nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like that. <laughs> Nothing like that. It's not about zombies. And it's not about Walking Dead. It's none of that. We'll try and describe a little bit what the Jewish view of resurrection of the dead and why it is. But just first of all, a little, a few sources, a few sources, because you could be saying to me, Rabbi, right here, where are you getting this from? Like, what's the evidence that one day there'll be a resurrection of the dead? Which, by the way, you'll be amazed as we soon, soon, soon see how its resurrection of the dead is ingrained in Jewish life. We'll get to it soon. So the real sources, like everything, it's somewhat hidden because everything to do with spirituality and mysticism isn't overt in the Bible, it's hidden, the oral law discusses it. And if anybody's really interested in seeing all the proofs, come speak to me afterwards, I've got them all on my phone, and I can send you the 20 different scriptural allusions, all there. I didn't want to bore you tonight going through all 20, but I will give you a couple. First of all, a very famous verse in Daniel. 
in the book of Daniel. And the verse is in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where God says to Daniel the following line, And may that sleep in the dust of the earth awaken to eternal life. So it's an, an explicit mention in the book of Daniel that there's this notion that people who are asleep in the earth right now, they're not going to be asleep forever. There'll be a time when they're going to be getting up and they're going to be walking around and they're going to be living like us. Another verse in verse 16, Hashem says to Daniel, now go to your way to the end and rest and sh you should rise for your, for your resurrection will be at the end of days. So literally Hashem explicitly tells Daniel that he's going to be resurrected. And critically, and as I said, there's another 18 different allusions in the Bible and the Talmud to Tchias HaMesim, but a few key moments. Maimonides, any of you ever studied some Maimonides? Maimonides is the one who really speaks about it at length and writes a whole letter on it. In fact, this, anyone ever see this? The 13 principles of Maimonides? Something that many say at prayers after the morning service every morning. And the 13th principle, a tenant of faith. In other words, this isn't some like legend. This isn't some, mm, sounds a bit wacky. This is, you want to be a faithful Jew? You want to have one of the 13 principles? It's principle number 13. And I'll read it out in Hebrew for me. It says, I believe with complete faith. That one day there'll be resurrection of the dead. And then it's interesting how he it doesn't just end it there. He does a little bit of qualification, a bit of a clue to what it's about. He says, the ace shiyale the moment that God wants, these other zikra the other netzachnotzachim. And it will be a remembrance for Hashem for eternity, which we need to come and work out. It seems that when we're doing resurrection, it's pleasing God. Now, what why would Hashem be pleased? Oh, people who lived 2,000 years ago are coming back. Why in any way, shape, or form? Is that pleasing God? Now, have you got any family members who said, no, 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 I want to be buried in Israel. I don't want to be buried here. Any of you? Family members or friends? Do you hear of anyone in your network who said, no, I want to be buried in Israel? Is there anyone you know? Mm, yeah. That's because of Trias HaMesim. That's because of the resurrection of the dead. We're taught in the Talmud, my friends. That since everybody's going to get resurrected, like my father, who's buried in Enfields, and by the way, for my dad, it was a big deal. Because on one hand, he really did want to be buried in Israel. On the other hand, my mom didn't want him to be. And, and, and my mom is like, if you want me to come and see you, <laughs> don't even think about doing this whole Israel shit. And my dad, being the amazing husband he was, he even decided in his death to get my mom to have her own way. And, and, and there are, and, and it's what happened, he's married, he's now buried in London and not in Israel because the benefit of Israel is the following. Anyone know, what, why would you get buried in Israel over England from a spiritual perspective? What's wrong with getting up and walking around Bushy? Mary, you know, I've seen actually a few, you know, living dead in Bushy before. So, so you know, what's, what's the big deal? What, what's wrong with walking around, you know, Elstree and Bushy and Chesant and Enfield? Why do you have to walk around Israel? What's the uniqueness? What's the virtue? Sorry? I mean, obviously, the walk to the temple will be a bit shorter if you're, you know, you get up in the Mount of Olives, no doubt. But it's more than that, actually. And it's actually learned from the story of Jacob. We're taught that Jacob said to his children, please, 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 please bury me in Israel. Don't let me be buried in Egypt. I've got to take my bones. And they took his bones. And he said, why? He didn't want to go rolling underground. The way that everybody's going to get resurrected, everybody's going to get up, from the Mount of Olives. And the rolling experience, like everything, like you know with London Underground, you know, it's not that pleasant sometimes, you know, especially if your, your, your bones are rolling a bit underneath. It's not like the nicest of experiences. You know, it's much more pleasant, you know, you just get up and, 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 and you're up and you're there. You're not going through a little bit of the rolling experience. But apparently there's some rolling gonna go on, whatever that means. I haven't got a clue what that means, but it was good enough for Jacob to say, don't let me buried in Egypt. I want to be able to just get up from the Mount of Olives. You should know there's a Talmud which says the very famous prayer we say, Az Yashir Moshe. The blessing, the, the song that we sang when we came out of Egypt, called the Shirah, is Az Yashir, it's in the futuristic. 
And the Talmud says it's actually really referring to after resurrection when we're going to be singing them. So we're going to be singing them. That's just a little allusion to that. Now, the real question is why? Why? And we're going to give you some interesting little aspects of, of resurrection soon. But just let's start off with what is going on. Hashem, like, really? I mean, obviously, it sounds a bit bonkers and it sounds a bit crazy and I'm, I'm fully aware of that. And what would be the reason? Can anyone have, like to posit a, a suggestion? Why would God create a system where, oh, I know what's missing. We need some like dead, pe dead people to come back to life. That's really going to complete and, 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 and make me happy. Why does resurrect, come on Anton, we've now, this is your, I think it's fair to say that you're probably the only person that's listened to every single one, probably verbatim, of our previous 48 hours of learning. So of all the 48 hours, what can you say, Anton? Why would we need resurrection? Why is this bringing joy to God? Go for it. Okay. Um, this wasn't planned. <laughs> so that... You're on Instagram, by the way, Anton. So. And Facebook. And Facebook. Extra <laughs> question. By the way, he's married, everybody, so he's watching. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the way I, I would imagine it is uh, the resurrection, that whole period, is a purification. And when we rise up, once we've been purified, God is going to be extremely happy with us. Why? Because we've gone through this death experience. You've died, and then you get up. That's just weird. And well, well, what is the, why is God saying, oh, yes, dead people have come to life. Awesome. I'm so excited now. Come on. You've got to fight with the rabbi. You've done this 48 hours. You know, don't give up on me. You know, it's like giving you shiva. I come and, like, you know, batter you down. You've got to come back with me. Can I try? <laughs> yes, Janet. I, I don't know, I'm just guessing. I'm not sure if it's connected or not. I know they always speak about the, the, the loose bond, the, the sister bond that you faith on the, when you do the. So let me just explain the, that. The, 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 the mystics explain, it's actually from a Zohar, that the bone that kind of everything is reconstructed from is called the loose bone, which is a discussion of which bone it is. It's either the back of the. Um, spine or the back of the skull. There's two debates. And apparently there's this bone which is indestructible and everything starts growing again from that bone. And the mystics say that we nourish that bone through what? Anyone know? There's a special the meal in the week. The, 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 there's, you're meant to have a meal when Shabbat goes out called Malaba Malka, escorting the queen, which is referring to King David. It's King David's meal, which is why it's connected to this topic tonight. And when you eat a meal... Maybe some of you, when you're watching Match of the Day, and you're having your bag of chips, that I'm sure Adam, that's definitely going to be contribute to your resurrection, no doubt. And 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 therefore, and therefore, <laughs> the food you eat on Saturday nights, you should before Match of the Day, you know, you should just say, by the way, it's good because that helps Spurs win often when I watch it, right? Mm -hmm. I make a little blessing first, and I say, you know, and this is in the merit of of Malaba Malka. And that helps Spurs win, please. Right, so, <laughs> so, so you're meant to do that, and that's doing on Motsi Shabbos. Now, the Luz bone is where it comes from. Now, the question is why. It's Lawrence, yeah. I was just thinking it's, it's the completion. You know, we talked about 49 steps and completing it. The concept of um, Hashem creating human beings in this, <coughs> this world is that we've got a mission. It's something that we have to complete. Not everybody completes their mission, and they come back multiple times until that mission is completed. And maybe that's the concept at the end of the days when we've completed our mission, we all come back and there's peace on earth and there's love and it's goodwill. Love that. Awesome. Beautiful. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to play. Right, that was cool. That was really, really beautiful. And, and I just want to expand on it in, in a few different ways. Number one, I'm going to quote, and many rabbis probably haven't quoted Queen Cleopatra before. But I'm going to quote her because it's based on the Talmud. But she asked a great sage, I actually went and put charity in his box just before I came. Great sage, who's the famous charity box from the Talmud, anyone? Rabbi, begins with an M. Meir Balanes. Anyone heard of Rabbi Meir Balanes? So Rabbi Meir is a famous fund, from the HOD, it's kind of the HOD in Israel, right, where they look after the poor in Israel. And it's a very special charity, which by the way, I lost something today. Um, and it's that custom, and people have lost their passports and things, and he put some money in his box. And you say, Rabbi Meir Balanes, open up my eyes. It's the most literally miracle stories of people who lose things, put money in his box. Maybe HOD will try that. You know, get an HOD charity box. 
and say if you lose things, I don't know, try something. But for Rabbi Meir, it works, but it actually really works, that's the difference. And so there was a discussion between Queen Cleopatra and Rabbi Meir and the following. Queen Cleopatra, he asked a great question. She asked, I've heard of this resurrection. When you're resurrected, do you get up naked or with clothes on? Isn't that interesting? And I think it's really interesting what she's asking. I think she's asking, asking a deep question. She's asking, is almost the ultimate, the body, which is kind of the, the, the Roman kind of philosophy, where the, the, it's, the, it's the worship of the body. Is, is that the perfection? Is, it, is, is kind of one's nakedness perfection? Or do we still need clothes, which is on a spiritual level, the hiddenness of that spirituality? Anyone, what, what do you get? What do you think? Because, you know, people are going to get up. Yes. More of a question. Sure. Is the third What's your name? Ariel. Hi, Ariel. Nice to meet you. Um, is the purpose of the resurrection for those being resurrected or for those seeing mm. the resurrected? I would say yes, yes, and God. Meaning it's it's for those, it's for those, and it's for Hashem. Because this is more of a proof. They're almost shlichim. Nice. It's everything. It's, it's, the, it's the conclusion of the symphony. It's, it's the totality of why we're here, which I'll explain in a moment. So the reason we're taught you, you will have clothes. And, and he brings a proof about the grain. He says when you plant a wheat kernel in the ground, it's, it's kind of put into the ground naked, says the Talmud. But then it sprouts with ropes. You know, and it's an amazing thing you have to think about when you plant a seed and then years later, trees grow and bushes grow. Says Rabbi Desler, listen to this. Any of you think resurrection sounds impossible, impractical, implausible? If you're an alien and you were told you're going to plant a seed in the ground and just plant it in the ground and then things are going to sprout up, you wouldn't believe it. But we see it every day of our lives. It's called nature and it's called gardening. And that's the system that Hashem has made. He's just yet held off on doing it for human beings. But the moment that Hashem's ready, you'll bang, and those that are, bought, that are buried will also come back the way it's meant to be. Now why? Let's understand why. So the Talmud says the following. There's a, there's a parable in, in Tractate Sanhedrin, page 91b. And it goes like this. There was a blind man and a lame man who the king asked to guard his gardens. In fact, I'm sure Anton Benedict Rabbi Tech says this often. You remember it now? And he asked them to guard it. And they were a bit cheeky. They were a bit lobbices, as we'd call it. They were a bit naughty. And they were like, okay, and the king's not looking. We want to go in. This is a beautiful orchard. We want to steal some food. But no one's going to think we can do it because you're blind and you're lame. And we've got a way of doing it. What's the way of both of them doing it? Anyone? Go on, Anton. You put the one on the shoulders of the other. Which one? You put the blind man on, uh, the lame man on the shoulders of the blind right, man. The lame man goes on the shoulders of the blind man. So the blind man carries and moves the, the lame man. And the lame man with his eyes will direct the blind man where to go. So that's how they did it. And they went and they directed each other and they got each other to the beautiful apples and they went and stole the apples. And then the king hears of their crime. And the king calls them into the a room like this, with a throne like this, and comes and says, I hear you've been sitting, and they said, no, no, how can we steal? You know, one's blind, one's lame. And the king says, no, 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 I'm the king. I know you're direct, you're jokes. And he went, and he put straight away the lame man on the shoulders of the blind man. And from that moment, he told them off, and he educated them, and he, he punished them. And by the way, I think the analogy is also the opposite. There's a bl blind man and a lame man, and they've got a job to do. They've got a spiritual job to do. And they help each other do that job, and then Hashem brings them in, and then He rewards them together. What is the analogy of the blind man and the lame man? Anyone can even think? How is that re relevant to ours? Body and soul. Body and soul. Which one's what? <laughs> Interesting. But essentially we're saying, you've got your body. And the body, in this way, doesn't have the eyes. The body hasn't got that spiritual antenna, doesn't have spiritual truth. And the soul has spiritual truth, but doesn't have a body. So we are this combination, we are everybody, this hybrid. You are all, you know, something to think about when you go home tonight, who am I? Ask yourself that. Who am I? What are you? Are you your body? No, you're not. Your body is, like, like I'm not my shirt, that's just the thing I'm wearing. Your body isn't with you per se in the next world. 
So, you know, my father, who, who left this world two years ago, maybe some of you know, already an amazing, holy, holy tzaddik, my father, who, who's left this world two years ago, he doesn't have his body with him right now in the world of the souls. He's purely his soul. But on the other hand, you're not just your soul. Because if you were just your soul, what would be the point of being created? So spirituality dictates, and this is learned from the book called Derech Hashem, The Way of God. We are here, my friends, to be this hybrid, this merger of body and soul, doing God's will. Let's give you a quick philosophy lesson. Here we go, very quickly. Why did Hashem make the world? What's the reason, anyone? Think about it. Why did God make the world? Why are we here? What's the point? Was God bored? Was he like, love? Oh, there's a world, sorry? But there was no mankind. So think about, think about a world prior to the world, where there was just Hashem, just God. So why did God say, hmm, I know what's missing, a world's missing. What, what prompted God? What was the catalyst for God? What was the motivation for God to create this world? Which, by the way, for HOD, this is really critical. Yeah. So God wants to give. To give, love. to give. And that's why you should know what you're doing in HOD. Mm-hmm. It's huge, because the greatest thing you can do is to give. So you're, 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 ex, you're devoting your time, your free time, to the act of giving. You are emulating God on the highest level. That's why we're here in this world. Hashem is a giver. When we give, we're, we're fusing ourselves with Hashem. That's why the famous phrase, Olam chesed yibaneh. The world was built for kindness. The world was built for giving. Or the phrase, derech eretz kadmana Torah. Before you can learn Torah, you've got to be a mensch. You've got to be kind. You've got to be a giver. It comes first. Start with Abraham, who's about kindness. So the world was created in order to give. Now, what's the gift? What was the gift? What's the big gift that Hashem wanted to give? Hashem wanted to give. He's a giver. So what's the gift? Anyone? Himself. The gift is not life. The gift is not free will. The gift is not this watch, even though it's lovely, Anton, right? That's not the gift. The gift is to have a relationship to God. The gift is God. Now, here's the big question. This is why we understand resurrection. Why didn't Hashem simply create the soul in the next world and allow that soul to have a relationship like angels do? What's the point and purpose of mankind and physicality and the universe as we have it? What's the point? If Hashem wanted to give himself, he could have just created you in heaven, like my dad's in heaven now, having a relationship with Hashem. Why didn't we just fast forward to that? What's the point of this whole world? Anyone? Perspective. Sorry? Perspective is Good. I like the second one more. Appreciation. Appreciation meaning, we call it in Kabbalah, Nahamad Sufa, which means bread of shame. Bread of shame. Which means, again, in HOD, I know when you do, and I, when I speak to Anton a lot, when you've had a big event, and Anton's exhausted afterwards, I say, amazing! I'm delighted you're exhausted, because that means you did good. The harder you work, the more you feel good about what you did. Agreed? If, if, if you, that's why nothing good comes easy. And that's why Hashem made this world. Now the problem is when Hashem made Adam and Eve, my dear friends, how we have life, it wasn't, it's not meant to be as it is at the moment. By the way, as it is at the moment is totally off kilter to where what the plan was. We've never been so far away to the original plan. The original plan was the following. It was a beautiful life, but the body was a vessel of your soul doing good, with peace, and unity, and love, and oneness. That's how it should be. And we messed up big time in the Garden of Eden. We had one thing to do, messed up, we internalized the evil, we, we spoke, we, we ate from the very tree that we weren't allowed to eat, which by the way they did specifically, and created 6,000 years of <coughs> chaos as we've had it now. And here's the point, and this is why we need resurrection. And really, it could have happened so long ago. The whole point for creating the world was for the world to be a reflection of God and to be a place of love and oneness and unity. So at least for a few years at the end, we're going to get the whole point of what it was all about. You know, how we have life at the moment with acrimony and conflict and controversy and stress, that's not how it's meant to be. That's not how it's meant to be. It's meant to be, you wake up and it's serene and it's calm 
and it's tranquil and it's beautiful and you're just kind of connecting to the higher source. So at least for a few years we're going to get that. And this is the sequence of, of events, everybody. We're now in the Hebrew year, anyone know? Five, seven, eight, two. We're about to go into five, seven, eight, three in a few days' time. 5,782. And we've only got 6,000 years of this world as we know it, says the Talmud and Sanhedrin, page 94, which no one discusses, no one argues. And therefore, between now and the year 6,000, which isn't a long time, anyone could have done the maths, we're now in the year 5783, and it only finishes off the year 6,000. Come on, any accountants in the room? Sorry? 270? 217, right? Yeah. To go. And... In that 217 years, so much has got to happen. Number one, Mashiach. We've been waiting 2,000 years. It should have happened from the year 4,000. The year 4,000 to 6,000 is when Mashiach will come. So first of all, this, we're not going to go into Mashiach again. You can listen to the tape from, from, from last, last time. Then we're going to build the temple. We get the third temple will be rebuilt. Then anyone that's interesting is the sequence. Then anyone, any Jewish person that's not yet in Israel will come to Israel. It's going to be that way around. There will be some Jews not in Israel at that point, and then eventually everyone will come. And then, and this really upset my mom, so I hope you're not watching, because she was very much, okay, she has to come soon, and then my husband will come back. And I made a bad mistake once, because I, I spoke about this publicly when she was listening, and I forgot that she was listening, because actually the, we're taught that it's 40 years after everyone comes back. Meaning, there's Mashiach, there's Amigdash, Kibbutz and Goliath, and then 40 years essentially after when Mashiach came, that's when resurrection happens. Meaning it's kind of evolution. Like it's getting better and better and better, and then the utopia. Like when we have resurrection, finally the world will be as it was meant to be all along, and at least we'll have a few years of how it always should have been. And by the way, there'll be two phases of resurrection. There'll be resurrection one with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. My dad, right? All the, all the greatest of the greatest will come first, and then everybody comes back. And then everybody comes back. And the way I think about it, imagine you're like an architect. Any architects in the room? So you've got an architect who maybe has a vision of this beautiful home they want to live. They want, they want, they're thinking of this beautiful home to build, the way it should be, and all with their family, but then they start building and everything's going wrong, and it's, nothing's at least. Let that architect have a few years of living out the dream, how it was always meant to have been built. That was God's dream. God had a dream. And at least for a few years, we're going to get to live out that dream because that dream will reflect that oneness. That's what Maimonides says. At that time, everybody will totally get it. Right now, we're living in a world where people are more worried about the cost of living crisis. And they're, they're worried about dealing with stress and, and, and how not to get on antidepressants tomorrow and, and this issue and that issue and this issue galore. That's not how it was meant to be. And by the way, it's not even how it needs to be. Great enlightened people are able to live now in a messianic experience. That's an amazing thing. We had, I brought last night a 73 year old rabbi from Israel who's just always just jolly and happy and smiling and serene because he's living on that zone. <coughs> So we can achieve that, but eventually the whole world, the whole world will achieve that. A few other interesting points. So if we come from the Mount of Olives, that which is opposite the temple, that's when, that's when they get up. Famous question is, if we believe in reincarnation, which one do you come back as? Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Already. I know, you have I, so I, many can, I can even mention it. The yes. famous question, right, we have got, got news for you. Doesn't We've been here before. Because what happens is when we don't yet achieve our potential, we come back and try again. Meaning, the soul in heaven, Hashem says, you haven't done your job yet. So for Jewish people, the 600,000 root souls, which can obviously, you know, proliferate into thousands. And then each one of us, you've got the Wayne part of one of the root souls and the Anton part. So which, who comes back? If we've been here many times before, let's say, come to the Lutzatu, we come three times back. Let's just call it, let's go with on Lutzatu's theory, come back three times. So who comes back? Which ones you come resurrected as? So it's a famous discussion amongst the Kabbalists. The great Ariza, the Rebetzal Gloria, says the one that was tikkun, the one that fixed any, any, any aspect that you fix the soul, that's the one that comes back. But it's very complicated. I'm not going to go into it now. Ariza's got a whole book about it called Shara HaGilgulim, The Gates of Reincarnation, which is actually accessible and, and it's translated into English and you can actually look it up online. But 
That's a very complicated question. But I've got news for you, especially all of you in this room now. So for sure, you're all going to be the ones fulfilling your tikkun. So definitely all of us, please God, will be, will be coming back. We'll be coming back for sure. But I want to conclude, my friends. I want to conclude with talking about something a little bit more tangible. Because that's somewhat lofty and somewhat esoteric. And I'm going to conclude my last few minutes of our 49 steps, which all completed the course, well done everybody, with the following relevance, which goes like this. The mystics explain that we all have the ability to resurrect in this incarnation. And it'll be interesting if any of you speak to me afterwards, if you will kind of like put your hands up to the fact that Hmm, I know what you're talking about, Rabbi. What do I mean? I'll start, I'll give you a story. Definitely not saying any names, but I've got a friend of mine who a few years back, everything went wrong. I always say when someone comes to a Rabbi, there's normally one of three things they come and want to chat with me about. Three big issues in life. Those issues either financial, or health, or relationships. Kind of, there's nothing else other, outside of those three. Those are the three things we're all praying for every Rosh Hashanah. If anyone can think of another one, I mean, I've got another one of them finding an apartment in Tel Aviv. That's like an issue in the house. It really comes under finance. I think finance wouldn't be a problem, right? So, so this is probably under finance still. If anyone can think of anyone other, I mean, spirituality, that's probably another section. If those who I wish they come to the rabbi, help me be spiritual. But most people, that's not why they come. They come in because I wish, right? But they come in because health reasons or finance reasons or relationships. So my friends, all of a sudden, finance lost everything. He lost everything. Then he got seriously ill. Then he had struggles with his relationship. And now this guy is without his wife and family, without his job, without his health. He was on the floor. He couldn't even, he was gone. He was depressed. He didn't want to go on. He had enough. He was suicidal. He came and saw me. And that was a hard meeting. I'll never forget. Where do, where do you even begin? And I said to him what Rabbi Nachman says, which is, Ein yeosh ba'olam. There's no such thing as despair in this world. You never give up. You never give up. Because when one door closes, another door opens. And it can open. And we can be resurrected in this life. We can go through a life where a chapter ends and it looks doom and gloom and it looks like it's all over, and it looks like there's no hope, but if we can just hang in there, and just hang in there, and don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, we can reconstruct ourselves and resurrect ourselves, and this time, the next version is better and higher and happier. And my, you know, my good news for you is now, seven years later, he's never done better. <coughs> he's happily married, he's smashing it at work, he's super healthy, and he's much more humble than ever. And he has in such gratitude more than ever. An appreciation for life and to God more than ever. So if any of you are going through a hard time, or if any of you have loved ones who've gone through a hard time recently or are going through, tell them this. Tell them that you never know what's around the corner. Greatness can be around the corner. You know, there's a... Um, the story of Isaac is what represents this. Yitzhak Avinu literally died. When God said to Abraham, I want you to slaughter your son, Isaac, according to the Zohar, Isaac actually died. And then he came back and he was resurrected. And that's why the, the name for Yitzhak means Kate's Chai. He's dead while he's alive. And the allusion to that in the Amidah is the first blessing in the Amidah is what anyone... What's the first blessing in Amidah? Baruch Atah Hashem, Magen? Avraham. And the next blessing is? Baruch Atah Hashem? Machayeh? Resurrection of the dead is alluding to Isaac because he actually was resurrected in this world. My friends, we can all be resurrected in this world and never more so than as we now are at the dawn of Rosh Hashanah. It's about to be Rosh Hashanah. My dear friends, the point of Rosh Hashanah isn't just to have an apple and honey and hear this shofar. The point of Rosh Hashanah is to be reborn. You know, Rosh Hashanah is not 
the anniversary of the creation of the world. It's the anniversary of the creation of man. It's when Adam and Eve were created. And the mystics explain we can be recreated every Rosh Hashanah. When, when the, the rabbi blows in the shofar, that's tantamount and loose and, and connected to when God breathed into Adam. We can literally be, be reborn. If any of you have gone through a tough year, many of us have gone through a very tough year, the good news is it's coming to an end. And next year can be as you want it to be. You know, this time last year I could do something that I can't do now. I went to the Ukraine. And I went and prayed to the great Kabbalist Rabbi Nachman. There's a custom to be there Rosh Hashanah. It was my first time I got there to Rosh Hashanah. It was very powerful. The prayers there were very powerful. And my daughter, before I left, said, Daddy, all my friends are getting engaged. Please, please, like, pray hard that I can get married this year. So I went, I went there Rosh Hashanah. And one of the key prayers I did, and I did this, and I'm giving you a big tip before Rosh Hashanah, everybody. So take this tip, because it works. I did what the mystics call the visualization. In the middle of my prayers, I didn't just say, Hashem, help my daughter get married. That's right. You can do better than that. Then you meant to say, I know she'll get married. And then I closed my eyes in the middle of the Ukraine. There was 5,000 people in the marquee. And I was just in my own zone. And I closed my eyes. And I started visualizing my daughter's kuppa. I imagined myself in the place where we like to marry our four daughters in Kinlos. Imagine my wife next to me, and imagine my daughter circling around this very handsome man, extremely handsome young man, going around seven times. And it's very amazing, because I came out of the service, and there was a big, one of the big tzaddikim in the Ukraine, I said, can I have a blessing for my daughter? And he said to me, it's done, you don't even need a blessing. And I, I didn't tell my wife and daughter that, because I didn't want to like, give them like a false hope. Like, what do you mean it's done, you don't need a blessing? I was like, okay. Anyway, thank God, last week, I was in Kinos with my wife on my right, and my daughter was encircling her beautiful, very handsome, my new son-in-law. And I shouldn't wait it to the end of the year, because when you visualize something on Rosh Hashanah, and it happens, it will always take place before the end of that year. Everything that's going to, that's why I don't know if any of you have found that the last few weeks, things that you're like living in fast forward, it's like bills coming in, bills coming out. You know, my wife called me up today, truly, and said, my, my, my car just got clamped. And, and this, and before you know, that bill's going to come out, and this bill's going to come in, and crazy money's been coming in and our, out of our accounts, especially with the wedding, I can assure you. Actually, it's going one way out, right? <laughs> and, and, and the point is that Hashem is paying all his debt to you because every penny that you've made this year or not made this year was decided on Rosh Hashanah. That's the power of Rosh Hashanah. It defines your whole year. How healthy you are, how wealthy you are, is everything's decided on Rosh Hashanah. So my friends, we can get resurrected for good. And I give you all a blessing that this will be the year where, please God, you'll have your happiest year, your highest year. I'll finish with a little true story. I always like to finish with the story, so I've got to finish with the story. It's been my custom for 48 sessions. I might as well finish on the 49th. <coughs> Little, I like true stories as well. This story, I, I got a beautiful new book called Rabbi Pesach Crow, and I like to write amazing true stories. So it's got a story about Rosh Hashanah young people, or true stories about Rosh Hashanah young people. So he says the following true story. He said, there was a, a man called Moshe Manis, and he was, it was the era of Rosh Hashanah, it was the eve of Rosh Hashanah a few years back. And, and, and there was a hat store in, in, in Brooklyn, which is very, very busy just before Rosh Hashanah. Everyone's getting their hat for, for, for Yom Tov, and he really needed to go home, and he was running late. And the, the owner of the store, you've got to stay, you've got to stay, just another half an hour, just another half an hour. So it's the eve of Rosh Hashanah, he's staying there, he's waiting to go home. And all of a sudden, this young man comes to him and says, Are you Moshe Manis? And he said, Yeah, I'm Moshe the young man says, can we just go outside a minute? I would like to speak to you. Hashem said, this is a bit strange, okay. The hats are here, like, fine. But he went outside. And the young man said to him, I've got to ask for forgiveness. I can't believe it's you. Never thought I'd see you again. He said, 10 years ago, I was a young little rebel, rebellious teenager. 
and I was driving around with you and you were selling a lot of goods and I was helping you, I stole from you. Without you didn't know this, but I stole some of your goods. And I've been feeling such guilt ever since. So I hope you can forgive me and I'm going to give you the money back. And I don't know exactly how much it costs, but I'm going to go now to the bank and I'll take out money and hopefully, if it's not enough money, I hope you forgive me. If it's too much money, I hope I forgive you, but I'm going to give you some money now and I hope you can forgive me. And Moshe Manis was, okay, now I know I had to be delayed. That's amazing. Of course I forgive you. I don't remember a thing, but... And he went out to the bank. He came back. He gave this young man now, gave this Moshe Manis $1,000. And Moshe Manis went back for Rosh Hashanah with this $1,000, thinking, that's powerful. That's what Teshuvah can do. To pay back your debts, to say sorry, to... To move forward can literally move you to a whole new phase. My friends, the point of Teshuvah is, Teshuvah isn't just about saying sorry. Teshuvah is about change. Teshuvah is about resurrection. It's about resurrection to, to the higher self. That we don't have to be our sins. We don't have to be our lower self. Someone could be angry for 70 years, but if they say, you know what, enough's enough. I've got to change. I've got to become more calmer and nicer and patient. One can genuinely be re resurrected as someone patient. Rosh Hashanah is essentially your opportunity to resurrect however you want to be. If you want to be kinder, be resurrected to someone kinder. You want to be more patient, say to God, that's, that's the way I'm going to be this year. Be powerful and, and, and focused in your mind. I can just one last idea. Do you mind, Anton? Listen, I'm not coming again, so it doesn't matter now. You, know? <laughs> you can't like be angry with me and say, next time, right? This is it. It's the last one. So just the thought came into my head. Just back to resurrection of why it's needed. Let's try and explain this. Maybe it's up the ditch who I went to when I was in the Ukraine. He was a good friend of Rabbi Nachman. A vicious lady, but maybe Yitzhak Baditch would say the following analogy to why there needs to be resurrection. Are you ready? He says the following there was a king, and it's very interesting now with King Charles, where we give it to all about kings, and you've got Rosh Hashanah and the coronation, all of a sudden things are going to be much more, maybe easier for us to relate to. Especially in the UK, there's a king now. There's a king, and the king's going out with his folks and with his townspeople, and he's got a servant, and he's very close, and that servant has done amazing for him, and the king wants to reward him, but the king says, you know what? I don't feel, just to give you a huge reward, you're going to feel good about it. I want you to feel good about that reward. So you know what the king decided? The king had a thought. And when they were got to the, the countryside, he dropped his ring on purpose. He dropped his ring in the mud. And turned around and said, if anybody can find my ring, I've lost my ring, I've lost my ring. The king's lost his ring. Whoever finds the king's ring will get a huge reward. And then the servant's so excited. It is a bit of a wally. And this servant starts now like stepping on things, pushing the mud down. Before you know it, the ring is now so embedded in the mud, it's impossible to find this ring. No one can find the ring. The ring's been lost. <coughs> and the king thinks, that wasn't a good idea. Now what am I going to do? <coughs> And in, the end, in the end, the king finally, with a lot of patience, has to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for the ring to be found. And only at the end can he give the reward. And that's what's happened in our world. The king dropped the ring when he created the world and asked Adam and Eve to do, just find the ring. And we just made it worse and worse and worse and worse. And worse. <coughs> the good news is, either which way Mashiach comes, we spoke about how you bring Mashiach, but there will be a time when the world will be as it was meant to be, and it will be one with each other, one with Hashem. And please God, this year, 5783 will be a year where I bless you all. You should have a year for you and your families of amazing health, of prosperity, of success in your relationships, success in spirituality, and HMD go from strength to strength. And please God, can this be the year when Mashiach comes, in Amen. 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 Amen.